This is a delicious recipe. I'm excited for this one. Acorn squash risotto. It's delicious. It's very, very simple to make. So if you're ready, let's get to it. Naturally, we have an acorn squash, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of shallot. Now I know that's not a traditional uh, ingredient in a risotto, but I like it. It's delicious, right? Got some Chardonnay, chicken stock, and we're gonna top it off with butter fried sage. Very simple, very good, it's easy to make. Naturally, of course, the first logical step is to cut up this acorn squash, get a roasting hopper, right? So I'm using this knife that my friends over at Santogu Knives sent me. It's such a beautiful knife. I used it a couple times. It has a very, very sharp edge on it. I like the handle on it. it feels good in your hand. They're beautiful knives. All the information will be in the description. Use my code, get a discount, right? Cut the ends off the squash. Just make sure you have a little bowl, catch any kind of trash, trimmings, whatever. Very carefully cut the rind off of the squash. That's why it's important to have a very sharp knife. I'm using a downward slicing angle when I'm cutting off the rind on the squash. This helps control the knife, ensuring that you don't accidentally slip. You don't only have to do an acorn squash, you could also get a good risotto with a sugar pumpkin with a butternut squash or a combination of all three, right? Inside this cavity of the squash, there are a bunch of seeds in it. So you could use your finger to kind of squish down and fill that cavity. And there's another part where the end is that you can cut. It kind of exposes the seeds a little bit. So you can save these seeds, plant them in your garden, compost them, trash them, whatever. This is why I like these knives. You could use the end of it and scoop out the seeds and such. Carefully using your knife, you want to cut off the flesh from the squash. You can tell where the seed cavity is, and I'm just cutting close enough to the cavity where I don't extract any of the seeds. As uniformly in size as you can, cut the squash into medium dice. I mean, you want to keep the cuts similarly in size, that way they cook evenly. Now you want to place the cut pieces of squash into a large mixing bowl. Decent pinch of salt, freshly cracked black pepper, a little bit of oil. I'm actually going to chop up a couple sage leaves and put it in there. Never miss an opportunity to add more flavor. You could flip it like this if you want to, use your hands, doesn't really matter. Get all those ingredients mixed up, you know, and evenly distribute that salt, the pepper, the sage. Man, it smells like fall time to me. So in a baking dish, spread it out, flat. You don't want anything overlapping each other. Nice, even, single layer. In the oven, 400 degrees for about 45 minutes. Elephant and garlic, really all they had at the store. A little information about elephant garlic that is not actually garlic, it's in the same family as garlic, but it's more related to a leek. It has a slight garlic taste to it, still works in a pinch. A nice rough chop on this is more than adequate. So, shallot, can you give this a fine mince? Cut off the end, cut it in half. I'm going for more of a small dice on the shallot. The shallot is going to literally melt into the risotto. Once again, you want to try to keep the cut pieces pretty uniform in size if you can. So now our next logical step is to get a saute pan going on the stove top behind us and start cooking the risotto. The risotto will pretty much be done at the same time that the squash comes out of the oven. See what I'm saying? It's all about timing. Really quickly, let's go over how to make this butter fried sage. In a saute pan, I have it set to medium temperature and I'm dropping in quarter cup unsalted butter. Add about a tablespoon's worth of oil so that the butter doesn't burn. Melt the butter thoroughly until it starts to foam. Now take two stems worth of fresh sage leaves placed directly into the foaming butter. Let them fry in the butter for about one to three minutes. Keep a close eye on them as you don't want the butter to get too hot and you don't want the sage to burn. Keep a close eye on them as they go from browned to burned rather quickly. Use a perforated spoon to gather the sage from the pan. Place it onto a plate that has been lined with a paper towel or a clean kitchen rag. Now let's move on to cooking this risotto. Nice big saute pan, has a nice thick bottom on it, holds heat really well. 
Set the burner to medium low, no need to warm up the pan. Add two tablespoons worth of oil, drop in the shallots, salt the shallots. This will help pull the beautiful flavor that the shallots have out. Sweat the shallots for about two minutes until the shallots turn translucent, stirring frequently. Add the rice, drop in a couple tablespoons worth of unsalted butter, melt the butter separately from the rice, and now you want to toast the rice in the pan for about three minutes. The rice will start to get a slight nutty aroma from it when it is ready. The rice will also turn slightly translucent as well when we're ready to move on to the next step. Now you want to drop in the chopped up elephant garlic. Now sweat the garlic down for about two minutes until the rawness is cooked off and it becomes very aromatic. Now we want to take one glass worth of the Chardonnay, deglaze the pan with the wine. We want to let the wine simmer away for another two to three minutes until it is reduced, stirring frequently. Hit it with a little bit of freshly cracked black pepper. The wine is fully reduced when you stir the rice and it leaves streaks in the bottom of the pan that holds its shape for about two to three seconds. At this point in time, drop in two littles full of warmed up chicken stock that is just below the point of simmering. Risotto is one of those rices that you want to stir very, very frequently. I'd say about every 30 seconds or so, you want to give the rice a couple stirs. The stirring helps pull the starch content out of the rice and it helps ensure that the risotto final product is nice and creamy. Once the stock has reduced and you can streak the rice on the bottom of the pan, go ahead and add two more littles full of the chicken stock. You can see the starch content starting to be released from the rice, which is a good sign, but we need to keep going. Adding the stock little bits at a time kind of helps ensure that you cook the rice to its appropriate doneness, which is al dente. There are a lot of arguments out there on how a perfectly cooked risotto looks. My approach to this is if the rice cooked to al dente and it has a nice creaminess to it but it's not super thick, you have the good consistency that is not too thick. And of course you could always add more stock to thin it out if you need to. Now add the baked acorn squash. This is definitely the feel that I like to have risotto. If it has a nice feel to it when I flip it into the pan, that's kind of how I know that it's ready to rip. A little splash more stock. You could add cheese, add a little bit of Parmesan cheese if you want it creamier. I like to throw up butter, pepper, finish with some salt. proper to me and then I love this sage too so good I keep the leaves whole sprinkle it right on top of that the sage is delicious like as soon as you put it in a mouth it literally just disintegrates mmm mmm that rice is nicely cooked has a nice bite to it but it doesn't stick to your teeth right mm. you don't need to have a whole lot of crazy ingredients in a dish to make it taste awesome you know what i'm saying all these ingredients are very very attainable and it is not super expensive this is probably like a 20 dollar you know adventure that we went on today so very seasonal very delicious and you want to give this a try so that's about all we have for today as always make good food eat good food and enjoy the rest of your day